Um, my topic for today is uh, the holonomy group spin 7. So I have a section 5.6 on this. printed timetable is, is, is wrong, so we're, we, we've adopted our own timetable. Um, uh, and well, if, if, if Jürgen wants to come along and say a few words, yes. the, right, the right kind of time would be 11.45. 11.45. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anyway, so this is the second of the exceptional holonomy groups. Um, so spin 7 uh, is a compact Lie group. Um, so in general, the spin group S O N is a double cover of uh, oh, sorry spin group spin N is a double cover of S O N uh, in any N. Uh, so spin seven is the double cover of S O N, and this is something which works in any dimension, um, and it. It has a representation uh, the spin representation of uh, spin seven, um, which in seven dimensions happen to be a happens to be a representation on R to the eight. Um, and therefore this uh, defines uh, an inclusion. Um, from spin 7 uh, into SO8. Okay, so and you, you kind of do this trick in any dimension, uh, but you know, spin 7 is the, is the case in which it happens to be a holonomy group. I suppose actually spin 3 is SU2, which is also a holonomy group. Um, now, in fact, so in eight dimensions, there are rather more choices of kind of holonomy subgroups of spin 7 uh, than in the other cases. So in fact, we have uh, the following uh, diagram of uh, inclusions of holonomy groups. So let's start with SO8, um, and then the space it acts on is so that this round arrow is going to it means acts on. Uh, so SO8 acts on R to the eight. Um, Sitting so inside this is spin seven, uh, also acting on R to the eight. I'm going to have a column here, and a column there. Um, so let's say on the left we've got a G2 acting on R to the 7 uh, cross R, uh, where uh, the action of G2 on the R factor is trivial. Um, and okay, so that G2 is contained in spin 7 as a subgroup. Um, going down one, one level. SU4 um, acts on C to the 4, which you can identify with R to the 8. Um, and in here uh, we can put SU3, uh, which acts on uh, a C3 direct sum uh, R2. Let's make that a direct sum too. Uh, where the action on the R2 is trivial. Um, and this SU3 is included as a subgroup in both G2 and in the SU4. Um, and go down another level. SP2 is a subgroup of SU4. Um, we can think about that 
is acting on uh, h squared, uh, the two copies of h, the, the kind of quaternionic vector space h squared, which is also identified with r to the h, or if you like, with c to the 4. Let's swap the walls around. Um, and uh, then finally, I'm going to put well, SU2 cross SU2, or if you prefer, SP1 cross SP1, sitting inside SP2. Uh, this acts on uh, H, direct sum H, which is R to the 8. Um, and here we can take just SU2 cross root 1, acting on uh, well, h or c2, direct sum an r to the 4, where the action here is trivial, um, and that can be included there. Okay, so there's a whole kind of tree of uh, interesting holonomy groups there. Um, okay, so well, one um, consequence of this is that well, if we uh, produce um, a Riemannian manifold uh, x for dimension 8 and g uh, with uh, the holonomy group of g contained in spin 7, um, we have to check that um, what well, if, you're, if you're aiming to produce a manifold with holonomy exactly equal to spin 7, we have to check that whole of G uh, is actually equal to spin 7 uh, and not SU4 or G2 or whatever else it might be. Um, so in particular, well so the left hand side can only occur if the fundamental group is infinite in the compact case. But the right-hand side, uh, these four things here, they can occur with simply connected um, eight manifolds. So we're going to need some other test to distinguish between spin 7, SU4, SP2, and SU2 cross SU2. OK. Um, so let's take R to the 8 to have um, coordinates uh, x1 up to x8, and again as a shorthand, let's write dx i j k l is dx i wedge dx j wedge dx k wedge dx l. And so as for the G2 case, uh, the spin 7 uh, preserves an interesting form on R to the H, which is a four form. Uh, so let's deform, let's define a four form, which we'll call big omega zero on R to the H by uh, so it's going to be a rather long formula. Um, omega zero is uh, so there's 14 of these terms, I think. Uh, dx, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus dx, uh, 1, 2, 5, 6, plus dx, 1, 2, 7, 8, plus dx, uh, 1, 3, 5, 7, minus dx, uh, 1, 3, 6, 8, minus dx, 1, 4, 5, 8, minus dx, 1, 4, 6, 7, minus dx, 2, 3, 5, 8, um, minus dx, 2, 3, 6, 7, minus dx, 2, 4, 5, 7, 
uh, plus dx 246h plus dx 3456 uh, plus dx 347h uh, plus dx 5678. Okay, so there's 14 terms here. Um, this is actually Hodge dual to itself, so they come in pairs. For example, star of dx1234 is dx5678, and so on. Um, now, the, the g23 form and the g24 form uh, each had seven terms. Uh, you can think about this as being built from the g23 form and the g24 form as, as something like uh, you know, omega is kind of dx1 wedge phi 0 plus star phi 0, or something like that, if you chose the appropriate. Um, thing. So, uh, if you chose the appropriate uh, numbering of the, the two up to eight coordinates, um, okay. So, um, so then um, the stabilizer group. Uh, of this form big omega zero in uh, GL H comma R which acts on the four forms on R to the H uh, is this group spin seven um, and okay so this this four form is a special four form um, as we'll see uh, it's it's not generic and you know, most four forms would have rather smaller stabilizer groups than that. Um, it's kind of a four form which is most symmetric, uh, really, apart from something like zero. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, well, hence, um, do I mean a four form that's least symmetric? Anyway, hence, by the relation uh, between holonomy groups. Um, and constant tensors um, uh, if you have that x to the 8 and g uh, is a Riemannian manifold uh, with the Holomny group of G is equal to spin 7, or actually contained in spin 7 is enough, if you have a particular inclusion, as it were, uh, then um, there is a natural full form big omega uh, on X um, with Nabla big omega is zero, when Abla is lever achieved a connection of G. Um, so such that um, well big omega and G uh, are uh, modeled on or kind of locally, locally isomorphic to well big omega zero and your standard metric G zero which is dx1 squared plus up to dx8 squared um, at each point. <coughs> okay, um, so in the seven-dimensional case, what we got, we had one three-form phi, and then we took its Hodge dual to get another four-form star phi. In this case, uh, we have star of omega zero is equal to omega zero uh, with our standard orientation, so it's self-dual, um, where star is the Hodge star. So you can't make another spin seven invariant form from that, um, and 
Okay, another important fact is that matrix G with the holonomy group of G are contained in spin 7 are Ricci flat. And that just comes from the fact that uh, the holonomy group constrains the curvature tensor um, and if you just look at the vector space of all possible curvature tensors satisfying first Bianchi and um, the first two indices lying in uh, the Lie algebra spin 7, all those curvature tensors have no uh, Ricci component. Okay, um, so as for the G2 case, I'm going to define a notion of spin 7 structure, which is actually a, an abusive notation. Um, let's make a definition. Um, well, let X be an 8 manifold. Uh, and then a spin 7 structure on X uh, is uh, a pair big omega G um, of a four form big omega and uh, a Riemannian metric G on X um, um, such that well at every point little x in big X uh, there exist isomorphisms from the tangent space t little x to big X with a standard vector space r to the 8 um, uh, which identify um, the four form omega direct at x and the metric g at x uh, on tx and big x uh, with the standard versions omega 0 and g 0 um, where g 0 is defined wherever it was uh, the standard Euclidean metric um, on r to the h okay so um, That's an abusive notation because I've already told you what is usually meant by G spin 7 structure, which is this uh, notion of G structure, a principal subbundle of a frame bundle of your manifold X uh, with structure group spin 7. Um, but uh, in fact, it's equivalent. So. Um, So this is equivalent to the uh, usual uh, notion of um, spin 7 structure as a uh, um, principle uh, spin 7 Subbundle of the frame bundle so equivalent in the sense that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between spin 7 structures in that sense and spin 7 structures in this sense um, also uh, you kind of don't need to include G in this because the the four form omega um, in well, G depends only on big omega. So if you've got omega, you can reconstruct G, uh, though not in a terribly obvious way. Uh, um, but it's just convenient to have a pair there, just for notational reasons, really. Um, OK, so uh, let's have a proposition. Um, which is uh, the analog of the first result I gave you about G, G2 structures. Um, if we say let big omega and G 
be a spin 7 structure on big X. Uh, so then uh, the following uh, are equivalent. Um, so firstly D of omega is zero. Uh, secondly Nabla of omega is zero, uh, where Nabla is the Levi Civita uh, connection of G. Um, and thirdly, uh, the holonomy group of G is contained in spin 7. Uh, and that's not quite enough uh, because uh, you need all to say that big omega is the induced four form. In the sense that if you're given an inclusion of the group of G into spin 7, you can reconstruct a, a four form from it. Um, okay, so. This may look initially a bit confusing because uh, you'd think that the second equation is strictly stronger than the first one, but we'll get to why that can be true. Okay, so if all of these hold, uh, then uh, we call brackets big omega G uh, a uh, torsion free spin 7 structure. Um, so this agrees with the notion of torsion free G, G structures um, I explained um, when we were talking about G structures. Um, so you can think about d omega as being the torsion of the spin 7 structure um, and uh, we call also the triple x comma big omega comma g a spin 7 manifold so for me a spin 7 manifold is an 8 manifold with a torsion free spin 7 structure um, <laughs> So some people would use spin 7 manifold uh, without the torsion free condition. Okay, um, well so let's explain uh, why it can be that parts 1 and part 2 uh, can be equivalent. So we'll note that and here um, in contrast to the G2 case um, big omega zero is not a generic four form on R to the eight. Okay, so for the in the G two case, uh, the G two three form phi uh, is generic in the sense that any nearby uh, three form is also a, a, a G two three form for a different G two structure. Uh, so the the G two three form wasn't really special. Um, but the, the spin 7 4 form is. Um, so we can do well, we can do a kind of back of the envelope calculation just in dimensions. So uh, well the orbit well the, the GL H R orbit of omega zero is um, GL eight comma R divided by spin seven. Um, well, that's just true because we know the stabilizer group of omega zero in GL8R is spin seven. So this sits inside um, the four forms on R to the eight star. Um, so this is the orbit, uh, just for general reasons, this is an embedded submanifold. In fact, a 
closed embedded submanifold. Um, so let's look at what the dimensions are. Well, GL8R has dimension 64. Um, spin 7 has dimension 21. So the, the quotient GL8R divided by spin 7 uh, has dimension 64 minus 21, which is 43. Uh, and the dimension of the four forms on R to the 8 are the binomial coefficient 8 choose 4, uh, which is 8, 7, 6, 5 over 4, 3, 2, 1, which is 70. Um, so this dimension is bigger than that dimension. Um, and the um, so we see that um, spin 7 forms big omega have co-dimension uh, 70 minus 43 which is 27 uh, in all four forms. Okay, so if you've got a uh, spin 7 form omega uh, the condition for a form omega to be part of a spin 7 structure is a, a point-wise condition on omega um, that it should lie in a submanifold of all four forms of co-dimension 27. Um, okay, so thus in part one of the proposition, where it's gone, uh, there, um, <coughs> uh, we should not regard d a big omega equals zero as a linear equation uh, since well it's kind of a it's a first order linear equation but omega also satisfies a zeroth order nonlinear equation um, uh, so since big omega is required to lie in a, uh, a non-linear submanifold uh, of the four forms um, lambda for t star of x um, and so this is why d of big omega equals zero can imply Nabla a big omega equals zero. Okay. Right. So, um, if we're trying to to construct spin seven manifolds or to study them, then we usually end up thinking about this equation d of big omega equals zero for omega of a uh, the special form of being a spin seven form, um, because that's a uh, this is a a nicer equation to study than that one because this has got many more components but most of them are, are unnecessary. Um, Um, well, a spin 7 manifold uh, x and big omega and g, by definition this is torsion free, uh, so d omega is zero. Uh, this uh, has a topological invariant. Uh, the Durham cohomology class of big omega in H4 Dirham of X, um, which you can think of as uh, similar to the Kähler class 
of a Kähler manifold. So that might be um, natural. If you're trying to describe some spin 7 manifold, then maybe one of the first things you'd uh, do is find out what it's that for cohomology classes. Okay, let's have a section 5.7 uh, on uh, compact uh, spin 7 manifolds. So initially just on the kind of general properties of them. Um, so let's have a theorem. So let's suppose that um, x and big omega comma g uh, is a compact spin seven manifold. So this theorem is aiming to give us uh, conditions under which the Holomby group of G is equal to spin 7 rather than is equal to one of the, uh, the quite a few other possibilities uh, which we had in our diagram of Holomby groups um, a few minutes ago. Um, so firstly, uh, if the Holomby group of G is equal to spin 7, then um, x is simply connected. Okay, so that didn't happen for G2 manifolds uh, or Calabi L3 folds, um, for example. Uh, those are allowed to have finite fundamental groups. But for spin 7 manifolds, uh, also for even dimensional Calabi L manifolds, they're forced to be simply connected. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a, there's a characteristic class called the A-roof genus, uh, we'll talk about it shortly, which is forced to have a particular value, in this case the value 1, now uh, for a, a manifold with long spin 7. Um, and if you were to take a finite cover of um, the, uh, your manifold with long spin 7, then uh, the finite cover would also have long spin 7, so it would have to have the same characteristic class. However, if you take a finite cover, then characteristic classes get multiplied by the degree of the cover. So using that argument, you can show that um, if you have finite fundamental group for a holomity group such as spin 7 or SU2M, then the, the fundamental group is forced to be 1 rather than just finite. Um, and yeah, and, and so general facts about Ricci flat things will tell you that uh, the Holomby group of a spin seven manifold has to be has to be uh, Holomby spin seven manifold has to be finite. Okay. Um, so secondly, um, well there is a topological inva invariant um, of X. Uh, called the uh, A hat genus. Or if you're American, it might be called the A roof genus. Um, uh, written A hat of X. Um, it lies in the integers. Um, and it's a characteristic class. So characteristic classes are um, well, they're, they're some kind of um, cohomology valued invariants. In this case, it's taking values in the north cohomology. Well, okay, uh, which is the integers. So it's basically a, um, uh, and it is the index of the positive. Dirac operator. Okay, so this is good, something which is good for any compact oriented uh, spin manifold. Uh, this, this topological invariant A hat of X is defined, it's an integer. 
Um, now, well, at least uh, as X has structure group spin 7, uh, it satisfies um, an equation in terms of the Betty numbers. So 24 a hat of x is equal to or well, minus 1 plus b1 minus b2 plus b3 uh, plus b4 plus minus 2b4 minus. So these are the Betty numbers of x. I've assumed x is connected, so the 1 is b0. Um, uh, so, okay, so the Betty number of x, this is a self-dual Betty b4 plus, the dimension of the self-dual part of the Ram group b4. That's the anti-self-dual part of uh, the Ram group b4. Okay, so uh, don't this equation is only good for spin 7 manifolds, or manifolds whose structure group is reduced to spin 7. Uh, and so the A-roof genus exists for general 8-manifolds, actually for general, uh, probably 4n-manifolds or something. But um, you can only write it in, in terms numbers in this special case. Um, but uh, the good thing about that is that it enables you to compute the area of genus uh, if you know the Betty numbers of your manifold, which are usually rather easier to find um, than the area of genuses. Um, and then the third part says um, C uh, if X is simply connected uh, and this thing is a spin 7 manifold so it has a torsion free spin 7 structure uh, then uh, A hat of X is either 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 um, and it determines the holonomy group of G, um, well, determines all of G by, well, firstly, all of G is spin 7 if and only if uh, A hat of X is 1. And the Holomny group of G is SU4 if and only if a hat of X is 2. Um, and the Holomny group of G is SP2 if and only if a hat of X is 3. And finally, the Holomny group of G is SU2 times SU2 if and only if A hat of X is 4. So these are the four uh, holonomy groups which occurred in the right-hand column of my uh, group of, uh, of my diagram of holonomy subgroups of spin 7 um, and you can distinguish all of them using this area of genus. Um, okay, so are you, are you all happy about what the theorem actually says? Um, yeah. Okay, so, well, um, so basically, this enables us to.
to uh, test for when the holonomy group of G is spin 7 uh, in terms of the topology of our 8 manifold X. So if we're trying to construct some um, compact 8 manifold with holonomy spin 7, <coughs> Then once we've constructed a torsion-free spin-7 structure on it, we can ju we just have to make sure that the uh, fundament that X is simply connected, uh, and its a roof genus is one, where we can compute the a roof genus from the Betty numbers using that equation. Okay. Um, so next, let's talk about the deformation theory of. Um, of spin 7 manifolds. Um, so let's have a theorem. Uh, if we let big X be a, um, a compact uh, and oriented uh, eight manifolds. So I want the orientation because the sign of the A roof genus depends upon um, the orientation. Um, uh, and as for the G2 case, I want to form a moduli space of torsion free spin 7 structures on it. So let's write curly M is. Uh, Moduli space, which is going to be the set of torsion free uh, spin seven structures um, big omega G on X. Uh, well, I suppose I want, if I'm fixing the orientation, I want oriented, so I want them to be compatible with the uh, given orientation, and then uh, divide by diff zero of x, uh, which is the group of um, of diffeomorphisms of x uh, isotopic to the identity. So, well, the conclusion is going to be that M is a smooth manifold. Uh, if you divided by diffeomorphisms not isotopic to the identity, if you divide it by all diffeomorphisms, then M might become singular. It might become something like an orbifold. Um, uh, so, the conclusion uh, is that then so the M is a smooth manifold Um, of dimension um, not dimension dim M well in the general case it's A roof of X uh, plus B1 of X uh, plus B4 minus of X um, but actually um, this is 1 plus B4 minus of X uh, for holonomies of G equal to spin 7 uh, because if in the case of holonomy spin 7 then A roof of X is 1 and B1 of X is 0 um, so it's a smooth manifold of that dimension uh, and also uh, the projection from M uh, into uh, H4 Diram of X R uh, taking the diffeomorphism and equivalence class of omega G maps to the Diram cohomology uh, of omega. Uh, this map is an immersion. Uh, immersion of manifolds. So roughly speaking, M embeds as a submanifold of um, 
uh, H4, although you don't know whether it might come across itself um, at distant points. Okay, um, so therefore metrics with Solon B spin 7 uh, come in positive dimensional moduli spaces. Um, bother, I've gone too slowly. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to have run by a few minutes so I actually get to the punch, my, punch line of my talk. Um, um, Okay, so the same thing happens as before. Because spin 7 manifolds come in positive dimensional moduli spaces, there is the possibility of a moduli space of metrics in some sense having a boundary. And then at the boundary, the spin 7 structures decay into something simpler, into several pieces with reduced polynomials well, smaller than spin 7. Therefore, you can try and construct compact 8 manifolds with polynomials spin 7 by first constructing the pieces into which it falls and then gluing them together. Um, so, finally, we'll have a section 5.8 on constructing examples of compact uh, eight manifolds uh, with polynomial spin seven. Um, so, well, basically by, by me, um, in 1995, um, uh, there's a construction um, by uh, resolving singularities of um, basically orbifolds of the form t to the 8 mod gamma um, and then kind of flat spin 7 structures. Um, so your, your typical gamma uh, might be, for example, z2 to the 4th would be the simplest examples. Um, and OK, it's, it's very similar to to the G2 case, uh, but then the details are, are kind of harder uh, in almost every respect. Um, so, well, finding examples is harder, um, and you need, you need more complicated, um, you need to resolve more complicated singularities. Um, so, one reason is that so in the spin seven k in the G two case, you could arrange to have your singularities of the form T three cross the singularity, and just separate them out. Um, if you tried to do that in the spin seven case, you would find that you'd produce something with a roof genus to zero, uh, which uh, well because of, you can show that using properties of the characteristic classes. Um, so, it's actually necessary to have an orbifold here which has some kind of special points uh, and at those special points different orbifold strata have to crash together um, so uh, you need you need to work harder on, on what kind of singularities we can resolve um, and also the um, somehow the the deformation to torsion free in some sense, it kind of only just works. So, and if you if you do a naive calculation on how big the torsion is and how, uh, and you th then you find that somehow you're at the cusp of where the method works, and so you have to work harder. Uh, you know, you have to do a kind of first correction to the thing before you can apply some kind of simple method or simplish method, um, and. Also, the business of working with these uh, these four forms, which are not generic, um, makes your life more complicated. Um, but anyway, so in the end, it you just kind of push the program through, um, and you can um, you can 
get you know many I don't know how many uh, compact eight manifolds uh, with holonomy spin seven uh, with uh, around about uh, 200 sets of Betty numbers uh, in my in my book um, uh, but actually you can distinguish different eight manifolds with the same sets of Betty numbers by uh, properties of the, the, the cut product uh, on the cohomology and therefore these represent probably a lot more than 200 distinct eight manifolds. There's also a um, uh, there's a second construction um, where you start uh, not with a, an eight torus um, but you start with um, a Um, you start with a Calabi Yau full orbifold with singularity of a certain type. You divide it by an anti -holomorphic, anti holomorphic involution uh, and then you have to resolve this. Uh, so this still has singularities and you have to repair the singularities of that. Um, and this is in principle, easier than that in some ways, uh, because you can arrange to have uh, a rather simpler sing singular set in that case, which is just some finite collection of points. Okay, so I'm sorry for having run over, but and thank you also for listening. Um,